Um, I work at InfoScout with uh, Sammy and Edward. Uh, we're a small uh, retail analytics company. Uh, what we do, we take pictures of the grocery receipts, turn it into data, turn around, sell that data back to brands and retailers. Um, my focus is data and making data look good. Actually, not making data look good, making data usable, right? So that's really all I'm concerned about. So we're going to start off tonight talking about modern art. Probably not what you thought you'd think you'd, you'd get tonight, but we're going to talk about modern art, all the way from impressionism to suprematism to fauvism. We're going to talk about data visualization. And we're going to do some practical application, because what's the point if you have no way to use it? Um, so modern art, we'll kick it off right there. This is not modern art. This is Renaissance art. <laughs> so you've got Van Eyck, you've got Raphael, you've got Leonardo, you've got Michelangelo. You can pretty much be assured that if it's a Ninja Turtle, it's Renaissance art. <laughs> so what are the hallmarks of Renaissance art? You've got idealized forms. Everybody looks really good. They've got great abs. Um, their horses are huge, they're rearing up. This is Napoleon crossing the Alps. So this is about 1900 by, um, uh, who is this? Paul La Roche. Um, okay, so let's, uh, what, what else? Um, other hallmarks of Renaissance art, mythical subject matter, biblical subject matter. It was paid for by kings, it was paid for by the church. It wasn't really about artists. This is modern art, right? Same thing, Napoleon Bonaparte crossing the Alps. Wearing realistic boots. Riding a mule, not riding a crazy horse. Look at, the, look at these boots. Who would cross the Alps in those boots? Um, everyday subject matter, so real people, not kings, not mythology, not biblical subject matter. And it was driven by the artists themselves. And it was also driven by paint technology. So like right about 1900s, paint started coming in tubes. You just, you could take it out into the field with you. You don't have to mix it up in the studio with egg and all that tempera and all that stuff. So, this is what, what happened, right? It all kind of kicked off with Impressionism. We're talking about 1900. Turns out modern art isn't that modern, right? Um, some of the stuff you see in galleries today is probably more contemporary art if it's, if it's new. Modern art's 1900, though. So Impressionism, this is Renoir. Real people, no mythical subject matter, no biblical subject matter. Real people, real lighting conditions. They're concerned about that. Um, this kind of led to fauvism. So fauvism falls under modern art. A lot of the, uh, all these fall under modern art. A lot of these fall under abstract art, which is kind of my passion point. Uh, but the important thing to remember about fauvism is strong, contrasty colors, right? Doesn't necessarily have to be what people look like, just strong, contrasty colors that people can absorb. Uh, talk a little bit about expressionism. Expressionism is about communicating your message more than it is portraying reality. And that's what we're concerned about in the data universe. We're concerned about portraying our message, how it's perceived. Uh, abstract Expressionism, so from the island, Olga Abizo. Um, the, all, the cover of the Stan, all the covers of Stan Getz albums, Olga Abizo. Probably more, what you're more familiar with is Jackson Pollock. Abstract Expressionism is the one that you say, oh, I could do that, right? Um, <laughs> cubism, so more abstract art here. Cubism is kind of. Taking, taking reality and boiling it down into small, simple shapes. Circles, squares, rectangles. People can absorb circles, squares, rectangles, triangles, simple shapes a lot easier than you give them credit for. Um, suprematism, this kind of, uh, the Russians got a hold of these <coughs> shapes and they put them to work uh, for propaganda purposes. Um, so all those are kind of abstract art. This is Picasso, he's the king of abstract art. Let's take apart um, one of his pieces. Um, there is no abstract art must always start with something after that. You can remove all traces of reality. So we're going to do the removing, right? <clears throat> but first, we got to start with something. This is Bull. This is about 1945. It's a series of lithographs. Not necessarily known what Picasso is trying to portray here. Maybe it's a Spanish people. Big, strong bull. He starts with a simple bull and goes to a big, strong one. Maybe it's fa Franco's fascism, right? This is a pretty evil-looking bull. Um, or maybe it's Picasso himself, right? This bull clearly has a human's face. <clears throat> But it, what he does is he identifies structure, and he removes, removes reality. You can see the head is no longer a real bull's head at all. Uh, it finds the center of gravity. He identifies all the key features of it. He deems the legs are not key. Uh, he moves, removes all those superfluous pieces, right? And finally, you're left with just what's necessary. And he does this to communicate his message. And Picasso's message, for those of you who know Picasso, is quite a macho guy, right? So what Picasso is concerned about is the horns, because that's the dangerous bit, and the huevos, <laughs> which is another particularly, p p potentially dangerous bit. Uh, 
All right, so we have one more piece of modern art to talk about, and that's Bauhaus. Bauhaus is a German school about pre-war, I think 1930s, um, a German school. They're concer uh, concerned with art. This is Gropius, uh, no, this is not Gropius, this is Alpers. He did hundreds of these, squares in different colors. Not sure why. Uh, actually, I am sure why. He was trying to find 3D space in a 2D reality. Uh, but they were also about architecture, too. This is UN building, La Cabousier. Um, they're also about typography, Jan Tischhold. Um, a lot of the stuff that Jan Tischhold laid out for Penguin Publishing would translate uh, for Berners-Lee when he was putting together HTML. All of that print stuff still holds up today. Um, and of course, product design. So this is Dieter Rahm's thermostat. And you can see what Johnny Ive did with this, right? So what Dieter Rahm's was about is, these are his 10 principles. And if there's designers in the room, I'm sure they've seen all these 10 principles before. I don't really need to drill into all of them. The ones that are very important for me are makes a product understandable, and the last one is as little design as possible. All right. Data visualization. Why is as little design possible important? OK, so we want to communicate our yada, 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 yadas. I took this from somewhere, and I hate it when people read their slides, so I won't bore you with that. I do want to pull out the, the important words, right? Communicate. How do I know my user? Do I know their context? How am I going to communicate with these people? Clearly, am I speaking plainly? Am I using a bunch of unnecessary words? Can I take out words? Efficiently, that's the important one. Take out the words that you don't need. People say less is more. I like to say less is better. Um, uh, no, sorry, less and better. How about that? Um, understandable, would my mom get it without an explanation? <laughs> She'll probably need an explanation, even if it's well done. But um, And is it usable? Because again, what's the point if you're not going to take this information and use it somewhere? Um, so what are the tools we have at our disposal? Um, we want to access the user using pre-attentive processing. So you put data in front of people, and sometimes they have to think about it, and they think about it, and they think about it. It takes them hours. That's great. It's important to learn things and dissect things. But if you can just shoot it right through their eye into their brain without them, help it, without them thinking, that's even better. Um, so without significant processing, the human eye and brain can distinguish differences in line length much like a bar chart or a column chart. They can also handle shape orientation, much like a line chart. They can handle size, right, like a bubble chart. And they can handle color, too. That's, that's the other thing they can pick up easily. You'll notice I didn't say radial degrees. So every time you find yourself using a pie chart, that might not be the most accessible piece. Um, all right, so who's this guy? Edward Tufte. Edward Tufte is a Yale man. He worked for NASA for a long time. He's widely considered the greatest American statistician going on today. He's on Twitter. If you're on Twitter, he's fantastic. He's got all sorts of opinions. Uh, we'll talk about two things that he talks about all the time. Data to ink ratio. So you're going to look at your graphic, and you're going to say, all right, what is the non-erasable ink expressing data in this graphic divided by the total ink used to print the graphic? I'm not a big fan of math, despite being a data guy. Let's just show you. Bad ratio on the left, your right, left, right, one or the other. It's, cor it's labeled correctly. Uh, bad ratio on the left, good ratio on the right. So basically what we've done is we pulled out the stuff that's not data and left the stuff that is data. Um, all right, so I'm going to blast through Tufty's last piece here. Uh, what is chart junk? Chart junk is any visual element that you don't need to get it. So unnecessary or duplicative labels. Heavy grid lines, uh, overly complex fonts like the one I've chosen here. Um, so you always want to use Helvetica, Arial. Not a big fan of Arial, but it's very functional. It's very functional. Um, get rid of the borders and the backers. I find that backers are a crutch. You don't need them. Uh, pictures and iconography in the plot. There is places for pictures and iconography in your plot. Um, those are called uh, infographics. Um, but that's not what we're about at InfoScout. We're about pre presenting serious data to our clients. Um, and gradients, hatching, drop shadows. OK, enough of that. Let's see how we do it. Uh, so everybody's seen this. Excel spit this out, right? So baseball players, uh, catchers, outfielders, shortstops, right? Somebody's put this together. So let's do what Picasso did, and we'll start ripping it apart, right? So we've got to take out the color, remove all the color, and we'll remove the grid lines. And we're also going to remove all the fills, and we're also going to remove that strong header flip it. I like black on white. Black on white is easy to consume. The eye can pick it up. We'll remember that pre-attentive processing, right? Uh, we're going to remove the borders. Uh, we're going to adjust text strings left. If you only take one thing out of this, this is the one to take. 
Text strings all go left. Value strings all go right. So we always want the text on the left because that's home base. That's where everybody goes to start the sentence. Every time you go back to the left, start the sentence. Value strings always go to the right because you want to be able to look down the tens column, the hundreds column. If you know nothing about the values, you know that Buster Posey is the highest paid player here because his number is the longest. It's just the biggest. Um, we adjust the table headers too, left, right. You want to match them up, right? Um, we want to resize the columns. This is a little fit and finish thing. You see Jared Saltalamakia gets his name there. It's nice. He gets represented properly. Oh, I don't think he pays for the Yankees anymore. All right, there we go. We got all those resized. Those look tidy. And we want to add white space and group. So sim simple, to, simple way to group these would be just to throw a line under a catcher, throw a line under outfielder, call it a day. But we can do it without the line by just adding some simple white space. There I've got it. Three groups. I know the th three groups that are important, they put that in the far left column. Those are obviously the key groups. So whole numbers, right? Nobody cares about your half career home run, right? Uh, and similarly, nobody cares about the 55 cents you made last year when you're making a, a cool million. Uh, so you want to round those round where appropriate, right? Uh, you also want to prune repetition, right? That makes those sections really pop. That's the difference. Uh, and Calibri, that's your father's font. I'm not a big, not a big Calibri fan. That's the Excel. That's the Excel standard. So let's just blast through this, huh? Ooh, too far. <laughs> Tufty, Data Inc., Chart Junk. All right, ready? One, two, three. Yeah. All right. Now let's do the same thing. Let's do the same thing with the chart, right? All right, so we got to think back to Albers and his simple squares and Kandinsky and his simple shapes, right? We've got bar charts here. That's how, how it's going to sing. OK, we also want to think about Tufty, uh, too, because Tufty's, Tufty's got good lessons here. The backgrounds, they're always a crutch. They're always a cheat. You can always take them out. Um, those backgrounds, too. We want to remove redundant labels. How am I going to do this without a legend? You can do it without a legend. Trust me, you can do it. It says it uh, right underneath the data, the labels are there. Sam Adams, Anchor Porter, Colt 45, Bub Light, Megalob Ultra, gone. It's still there. We haven't removed anything that wasn't duplicative. Uh, how about the, uh, the x-axis, type of beer? Well, it says it right in the label. Calories of yada yada, different beers. We don't need to say that. Number of calories also says it in the label, uh, also says it in the title. Let's get rid of, let's make it even simpler. So this goes back to context, right? I'm presenting this to someone at Anheuser-Busch. They know that Sam Adams is a beer. They don't need me to tell them that in the title. Uh, let's remove borders. All those borders, get those borders, get the borders that go around those. Yep, we get those too. Uh, how about fewer colors? This is a, is this a questionable place, right? I always tend to prefer, prefer, uh, prefer fewer colors because if I have, if I have just one simple color, then I, when I add that other one, ooh, it really pops and I can say, this is the one that you're supposed to pay attention to. So two colors is always a good thing to do. Uh, no drop shadows. I, there's no sun on this page. I don't know why it would even be casting a shadow in the first place, right? Um, how about uh, no gradients, right? Uh, I'm always confused by gradients, right? Is the cal are the calories at the top of the bar like heavier than the ones at the bottom or lighter? You don't need them. Just flatten it all out. Nice, simple color. The upside of making things simple is it's easy to develop. Don't tell anybody. It makes things easier to develop. Quiet, you two. <laughs> um, so you want to dial down the labels, because they're not the data. The data is the most important thing. All right, we're going to dial down the grid, too. We're going to remove the grid now. This is getting edgy. This is getting edgy. Now it's getting real dicey. It's getting real dicey. Is he going to do it? Yeah, yeah, it, gone. This is useless. This is useless. We went too far. But it can be easily solved by direct labels. We're just going to smack those labels right on there. Nobody has any questions. Sam Adams, it's a lot of calories. <laughs> so, so hey, right? Colors can be fun, too. I, I got no problems with colors, but you got to be real careful, right? It's real tough to read. Thanks. Um, go home chart, you're drunk. These are the ones that kill me, right? This is, this is the infographic. Um, while the heights are correct, the heights are correct, right? But the volume is not necessarily correct. I just don't want anybody to be confused. And if, if I do that, nobody's confused, right? So these do have a place. Um, BuzzFeed, um, your social feed, like whatever it is. Infographics have a great, great place in the world. 
but at least in terms of professional data analytics, probably not. Key takeaways, what do we take away? Less and better, I, as I said, I used to say less is, less is more. Uh, you, I'm sure you've heard that everywhere, and that's pretty good. Um, but less and better is really great. So when you edit words out, you also want to think about, could I use better words? I could probably use better words, too. Um, put function in front of form, particularly when you're trying to communicate. Um, style is important, um, but communicating your message is more important. Um, and if I have to sacrifice form for function on my team, happy to do it, always happy to do it. And iterate fearlessly, just like Picasso. Um, mock it, mock it again. Um, I, my old boss used to say mocks are cheap. Um, compared to code, they certainly are. Um, so don't be afraid to mock it, mock it again. And if they ask one more time, you just humor them, mock it again. And that's it for me. Uh, if you want to follow me, I'm M3 Arnett. That's a B, kind of. Um, if you also want to look, follow some stuff, I, I really, uh, really would, uh, would say go to Reddit. Data is beautiful. It's a fantastic place. Um, I share all th sorts of things from that and pretend that I, that I found them. Um, uh, that's fantastic. If you're a baseball fan, uh, Fangraphs is also a fantastic data site. Print, it's not dead yet. Um, yet. Uh, the Economist, National Geographic, and believe it, uh, Popular Science is fantastic too. A few people to follow on Twitter. Um, if you are a developer, you've got to follow Mike Bostock. Um, MB, and Bostock is kind of the, the D3 guru. And that's it for me. Thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. <laughs>